Hello, I'm David Garcia, Chair of the Department of Music here at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I'm super excited to be hosting colleagues in celebration of the publication of a new and exciting book titled Performing Commemoration, Musical Reenactment and the Politics of Trauma. In the past, the department has hosted similar gatherings in person to celebrate book publications by our faculty. With the support of our staff, we are able to continue this tradition via our department's YouTube channel. So we hope you enjoy this conversation and we welcome you to reach out to our faculty guests about their research. So let me begin by introducing our guests. First, Annegret Fauser, Carrie C. Boschmer, Distinguished Professor of Music and Adjunct Professor of Women's and Gender Studies at UNC Chapel Hill. Welcome, Annegret. Thank you. Then Michael Figueroa, Assistant Professor in Ethnomusicology, Department of Music at UNC Chapel Hill. Welcome, Michael. Hi, everyone. Imani Danielle Mosley, Assistant Professor of Musicology, School of Music at the University of Florida. Welcome, Imani. Hi, everyone. And Andrea Bowman, Associate Professor, Department of Music at UNC Chapel Hill. Hi, Andrea. So we're going to um, go through three rounds of questions uh, just to kind of give us a bit of structure and structure for the audience as well. Um, and so I'm going to begin uh, a first question for the co-editors of this, uh, of the volume, uh, who's Annegret and Mike. Uh, so Annegret and Mike, can you tell us about the project and how you came to it as co-editors? Mike, do you want to go first? Um, sure. Um, so there was a concert scheduled for um, spring 2017 called the Defiant Requiem. Um, that was a, a big production that uh, was a collaboration between the music department, uh, the college, the center, the Carolina Center for Jewish Studies, and a few other entities. And um, Annegret and I were chatting uh, over lunch one day. Uh, about this concert, and we started talking about all these sort of conceptual questions around reenactment and commemoration, and we started brainstorming a project that maybe we need to collaborate on something and have a conference, maybe even a publication. Um, and um, yeah, it, it, it's, it started from a chat and became a really big endeavor, um, as you see with the, you know the book that we're here to to commemorate right now. I think one of the things that's quite important is that the whole project grew out of a reenactment event and it was really something for us to think about what does this mean? What does it really mean to perform commemoration to do these kind of things? Because there are a lot of assumptions, there's a lot going on uh, in terms of overwriting, reconfiguring, etc. Uh, when such an event happens, when reenactment happens. One of the questions that set us both off when we were starting out uh, over lunch was we were thinking, you know, who controls what gets reenacted and how does it get reenacted? And I think that was really the kind of crux from which we were going. And what was great was we, I think, Mike, that's correct if I remember it right. We were thinking about publication pretty much from the get go. That's right. Yes. And I mean, I think the major issue that we were having, you know, there was the power dynamic and the, the question of agency that Annegret articulated. But there was also the issue of, of what kind what kinds of fidelity do reenactments have as forms of commemoration? You know, because there's a, a kind of a, a, I think, a tacit public understanding that a reenactment is a sort of transparent window into something that happened in the past. And it's clear to scholars of commemoration and performance studies scholars uh, and many others that reenactments are anything but. They're a set of creative choices that have ideologies um, and various dynamics of power embedded within them. And so we set out to sort of explore this from a, a cross-cultural perspective in our project. And I think if I can just continue on that, the really important thing was that it was cross-cultural from the get-go. We were aiming at five continents, which we achieved. We were really trying to go also not just contemporary, but sort of add a historical dimension to it. And um, 
I did start with that conference that then got expanded and reconfigured for what became the, uh, the volume. One of the things that I found quite touching or actually quite powerful is a better word, uh, was that one of the uh, participants in the conference said, you know, it's really strange. One would have thought we all had already shared all of our papers beforehand. So closely are they actually inter interlaced in what was going on. And I think that was what got Mike and me really saying, this has to come out as a book. And so that's also, if you look at the book, I think is the quality of it, that it doesn't feel like lots of little pieces strung together in an edited volume, but it's very closely interconnected in terms of topics, in terms of issues. In, indeed, and, and one of the themes that uh, really struck me throughout many of the uh, chapter contributions to the edited volume is the theme of silence. Um, and so uh, with that, if I could move to our, uh, our next guest, who's uh, Imani, whose chapter is titled, Say Her Name, Invocation, Remembrance, and Gender Trauma in Black Lives Matter. Imani, you explore how commemoration in music has unfolded in the Black Lives Matter and Say Her Name movements since these movements emerged in the earlier part of this last decade after the murders of Trayvon Martin in 2012, Mike Brown and Eric Garner in 2014, Sandra Bland in 2015, Breonna Taylor in 2020 and others. Um, your analysis is framed around black embodiment uh, specifically uh, around a, a male embodiment uh, with respect to the Black Lives Matter movement and the absence of female bodies in the Say Her Name movement. Can you discuss how the unheard and unseen voices of Black women victims of white supremacy in policing and in U.S. society in general are recuperated in what you theorize as the orality of naming? Sure, yeah, thank you. Um... I feel that it is one way out of maybe the possibility of, of many that are being explored um, that allow for a space for Black women, um, especially Black trans women, but, but Black women writ large, um, in order to uh, be realized as a part of um, feeling a lot of and be on the end of a lot of violence um, from, from the state. Um, and that in seeing that, we can also look at the way that Black women are, are treated and understood um, and, and figured as a part of society writ large. Um, there's been this history around this kind of naming and, and invocation and locating of one's self uh, within a tradition and within society and, and by focusing on naming rather than body, um, it allows the opportunity to take away from a kind of spectacle that could be imposed on, on the, the harm and death of, of Black women. Um, I think it's no surprise that often when Black women are murdered, we don't see it. Um, and it figures into a larger silencing of, of, of women and crimes and violence against women, that they happen in unseen places, that they're not discussed, they're not theorized in the same way, um, they uh, don't receive justice in the same way, um, and naming allows uh, a space out of uh, shadow, uh, a space out of a silenced victimhood, um, a way of, of focusing on the things that have not been sort of destroyed by, by violence. So this kind of oral process, um, it kind of rings inside of us. We don't have to think about the, 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 the visual nature of, of that violence and instead can focus on on the women who have been you know erased and, and, and shadowed. And so some of the musical examples that you introduce in your analysis to explore further uh, how this naming um, and in general orality unfolds in music is some of the examples of uh, uh, Blood of Oranges, Sandra, Sandra's Smile from 2015, Janelle Monet's 
how you talk about from 2015. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, one of those or uh, some of your examples in which you further analyze the issues that you're, you're focusing on in your chapter? Sure, the blood orange example is really interesting because um, in reading the annotations um, of the song that were put up on uh, genius.com, um, the artists recognized in that moment that they had not thought about Sandra Bland in this way. They had not thought about her own voice, that she had been erased even for them. And in the process of writing uh, this song, that it was a way of addressing their own uh, their own part in her erasure, um, which is really interesting and kind of profound, I think, um, that for a community of, of people, specifically Black men, um, that there is an engagement in that silencing um, and that there's a distance between the way they understand how they are victimized and how they are treated um, by the police and how that's fundamentally different from the way that black women are, are, are victimized and treated by the state. So the song is kind of a working out of that process. And by thinking about Sandra Bland in a new way um, and by focusing on all of these other non-embodied um, aspects, uh, you know, by titling the song Sandra's Smile, um, it was a way to kind of make up for that engagement in erasure and the focus that I think a lot of um, artists, uh, not just black male artists, but, but artists in general um, have on the, on the body when addressing these kinds of issues in their, in their songs. So uh, thinking about Sandra Bland in, in, in this way through this song, I think is, is even more powerful uh, because of not only that focus on, on naming, but also because it's, it's an act on the part of the artist to uh, recuperate um, both, both her name and her story and also uh, recuperate their part in, in the process of erasure. And I want to pick. I want to pick up on that that theme of erasure, along with uh, silence, mm -hmm. and continue this conversation, and actually go back to our co-editors to the introduction, where it begins. Uh, you 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 both introduce us to the volume by bringing us to the campus of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill with respect to Silent Sam. So um, I wonder if Anagret and Mike, if you could talk a little bit more about that part of the introduction that is serves and functions as an introduction for the reader to the entire volume. Mike, you go. Well, I'll just, I'll just introduce um, our co-improvised response by saying that it was important for us to be, this was such a thoroughly UNC project in a lot of ways, um, being that it grew out of a conference here that brought together many campus entities, um, that we are in the middle of various crises, the Silent Sam monument, um, removal being one of them, um, we found it to be, we, we wanted to ground this broad cross-cultural, you know, intercontinental discussion across the, the contributions in the local, right? Um, and to, to indicate the stakes of a conversation around commemoration um, by, by draw, you know, by bringing it home um, quite literally uh, to, um, you know, a few hundred feet away from our offices. Yeah, I think it's, it was this experience of something happening that we were at the same time working on with our colleagues uh, that really drove it home through Sound Sam. And one of the things that had happened was Andrea Bowman had just co-published an article that dealt with sound walking around the university and what does it mean to have sound Scape, sorry, I know you don't like the word, but sounds happening within within our own environments, and uh, so so to deal with that, I think was quite important. Um, it's also, in a sense, bookmark ending um, the period we are addressing in in the book between the dedication of the monument and its tearing down, 
and the ongoing relevance. I mean, this is still an ongoing saga as uh, we are following in the Daily Tower Hill and at other places. So, so Silent Sam crystallizes a lot of the issues that have been discussed elsewhere and it's a good way for us to tie it to our own experience of a highly problematic uh, commemorative culture in which then performative elements of disruption worked very, very powerfully. Yeah, I will say that I think its inclusion also in some ways is a commemorative act in the sense that our university archives, our student activists and our faculty activists who are part of dismantling the statue are, are their voices shine through in our text. You know, um, the, the, it's the, bringing down the statue was their effort. Um, it was their voices singing, right? Um, and so um, dignifying that um, through our work, I think is, is, um, is, is another contribution of, of the text. And that's a perfect segue into um, Andrea's contribution. Andrea, your contribution titled Overriding Sound, P Polish Commemoration in Concert, takes the reader down unexpected paths towards questions surrounding, um, and I'm quoting you here, the excessive overwritten commemoration landscape in contemporary Warsaw, uh, or what you say elsewhere as, quote, music's ability to be ignored, to underwhelm, and to the poorly mic'd. Can you tell us how spaces such as Warsaw, as you observed in the summer of 2014, can be saturated with commemoration, but yet significant musical acts, for example, sing-alongs, still materialize sometimes even in the margins of mass gatherings? Yeah, sure, it's interesting to um, think about a sing-along at the base of Silent Sam or a chorus of recited names in the context of Black Lives Matter in comparison with the Polish context where I think sing-alongs carry with them a less um, fortifying um, cultural resonance and um, more of a, a longer history of um, coercive singing or um, that have to do with histories of fascism and um, and prescribed um, ideologies of mass singing, which have various various sort of legacies and embodied knowledges um, of people. Um, so it's kind of challenging actually to imagine that that sing-along um, or, or singing at the base of Silent Sam could, could mean the same thing as singing at the base of the fallen, the statue of, of the grave of the unknown soldier. Um, in the giant square um, at the center of Warsaw that is a result of the destruction um, of a historic um, imperial palace. Um, one of the things I notice, I guess I take, I think my chapter functions as kind of part of like a, a more um, worried um, tr uh, set of essays in the volume um, that, that raises questions about when commemoration starts to coerce people into certain hegemonic um, histories. And I mean, I think Imani, you, you narrated really beautifully the way in which media, um, media and uh, dominant media narratives, especially with um, preying on viewers fascination with hurt bodies, for example, right, to reframe the body and, and, and um, take it away from the person whose lives and, and family who's, who, who, who lost a living, breathing um, human. Um, so in, in the context of Warsaw, I, I think um, what I really noticed in my fieldwork is that there was huge dissonance between the way places were represented and the way these events felt on the ground. Um, so um, large television broadcasts of crowds singing in unison were actually on the ground. You could feel um, some people not singing along, right? Or um, singing along on the margins as the passage you quoted, um, during Independence Day actually has to do with stimulating um, aggression, nationalist and, and uh, violence um, in the manner that we've now seen um, intrude on our Capitol building. Um, and this, this gets back to the kind of way that, that um, uh, scholars in ethnomusicology have called this like the snowball effect of, of unisonal singing, right? Of singing together, right? Is that it, it gains energy and it gains momentum. I think that's really, um, one of the things that I'm trying to kind of understand, when can we see that momentum go from being solidarity forming to something more um, dangerous, more um, combustible? 
Um, and it is in some of these programmed events, some of the ways media works. And it's, but it's also in, um, in if, if we as scholars start to not do what Annegret talked about, which is saying we need to m mark the moment um, in history at which this book comes out, because even since its publication five months ago, I think, I mean, certainly, I mean, we all wrote our essays much longer ago than that. And the research upon which they were based predated that, but I would write a different essay today and certainly about the same spaces in Warsaw where very different sing-alongs have happened in the last five months as the main protests have been about reproductive rights and trans rights. Um, and so song sound happen again differently and again, overwrite and obscure some of those more nefarious or I'm skeptical about them um, practices, nationalist practices um, that, my, that my essay take, takes issues with. I want to pick up on the historical layer, Andrea, of your, of your essay, right? Because it's, it's also a very com uh, important component of your framing in an otherwise very uh, visually rich description of Warsaw uh, as you were uh, analyzing your, uh, or presenting it as such in, in the summer of 2014, and, 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 and transition to Anna Gretz chapter, which also um, the historical layering is an important part of, of, of the issues, Anna Gret, that you're focusing on with respect to your uh, specific contribution to the volume. So your chapter is titled, In Sounding Trauma, Performing Commemoration, Western music in time of war and tumults, in which you discuss the sonic emblems and tropes of battle in Western art music across historical periods, uh, namely or to include World War I and World War II, um, and geographic, cross geographic regions and national borders. Um, and in the course of your writing, the reader also learns about how commemoration in music entails, for example, silences, traumatic significances, disability, and social justice. Can you discuss how silence, disability, and social justice emerge in music that otherwise is intended to commemorate war? Um, I can only scratch the surface as I have in a sense done in the chapter that would be worth two or three books. But one of the things that I found really striking, the more I was looking at the sound of trauma, the sound of war and coming out of war, the more I was struck by how silence was configured and what silence has been meaning. And one thing, there are two things I want to talk about. One is silence, as in absence of sound. Even if you know bells are tolling, there is a kind of sense that there is no sound and that comes out of the moment when World War I ended. World War I was the first war that was kind of globally noisy, so to speak. It was a mechanized sound. Nor, I mean, that war is noisy. We know that. I mean, whether you get shot at with muskets or you get shot at with cannons, it's, you don't want to be there. And it's very noisy uh, with the horses screaming if they get shot in all the warfare and stuff exploding in current warfare. Um, what happened in World War I was that the parties agreed on this exact moment when the war would stop. And so you can actually have these, these writings uh, with, with these, 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 these machines where you can see that it stopped at 11 a.m. on the 11th of November, so 11, 11, 11. And this experience of stopping the sound of war became both something people have viscerally experienced and they talked about it, but also something that then got commemorated in these moments of silences. George V started introducing this. So, so the sense that there, the absence of horrid noise, terrible noise, gives both a commemoration for those who perished and a kind of sense of peace. So there's that side of, of silence, but then there's another side of silence that the longer I have worked on this, the more painful I became, uh, the more I became aware of the painful aspect of silencing. So if you have silence, now I'm talking about silencing, and it is the silencing through commemoration of a lot of people, those who don't fit the parameters. Let me just give you one example. Um, those who get commemorated in wartime commem uh, in commemorations of war are those who died. 
So you have all these for the fallen, you have people who got killed. Those who don't get commemorated are those who become disabled through war, those who have who starve, those who deal with violence, those who are raped, all of those, they are suffering, their trauma is silenced, they have no place in commemoration. And so I got into that uh, through two elements. I got into it on one hand through a, one film that shows it quite powerfully, which is Gold Diggers of 1933, where there is the song, uh, The Forgotten Man, the person who comes back and then has no space because he is uh, injured. And uh, you have the, a lot of post-war societies didn't want to see anyone. And the whole thing with disabled veterans was to pass as able. And then you have a second example uh, of performers like uh, Wittgenstein, Paul Wittgenstein, the pianist, who lost his right arm in battle and he came back and performed with his left arm. And that's a really interesting way in which we see it and how people at his, in the time saw it. We now have all these historians who imagine, I got quite angry when I read this actually, who imagine this kind of sounding of, of, that, of that absence in compositions. Whereas at the time, it was all about appearing able-bodied only with one arm. So the thing that Wittgenstein got told was he was doing great, was he was playing as if he had two hands and he did the feat with one hand. And so it's this kind of injustice that got me quite riled up. And I think one can actually see that in the text because I got angrier and angrier as I wrote. Yes, there are indeed very uh, many moving and powerful um, uh, moments throughout uh, the chapters of the volume. And I, uh, Andre, if you don't mind, um, I'd just like to read one from your contribution uh, as a reflection of um, uh, your answer. And you say on page 26, in the 1920s, silence thus became both a marker of peace and a signifier of civilian post-war suffering. Silence also served to keep trauma unspoken. And, and that actually connects to uh, Mike, uh, much of the, um, the profound uh, insights that your chapter um, gives us um, and the title of which is Musical Memory animated amnesia, the soundtrack of exoneration in Waltz with Bashir, uh, which takes us to the Lebanese civil war of 1975 to 1990. And one person's experience as a participant in that war, um, Ari Fulman, an Israeli soldier who was at the Sabra and Shatila mass massacre of Palestinian refugees in 1982. Um, 26 years later, Fulman writes, directs and narrates the animated film Waltz with Bashir uh, from 2008. And the aesthetic and moral power of which you write derives, quoting you now, from the memory work performed by its musical soundtrack. Can you talk about how the film's music enacts this work of Fulman himself, and then perhaps also the film's audiences? Yes, thank you, David. Um, so uh, just a little context around writing this. Um, this film, Waltz with Bashir, um, is to be sure an aesthetic triumph uh, in its various sensory domains, the visuals, uh, the music, which I'll get to in a second. Um, it was met with a kind of, um, I won't say unprecedented, but an extremely high level of international acclaim for an Israeli film. It is novel as being an animated documentary, which is, you know, sounds like a paradoxical term, right? Because um, the fact that it's animated draws attention to the artifice of filmmaking um, or the craft of filmmaking uh, as a mediating force in documentary. And um, it actually is a much written about film in um, both English language and Hebrew language scholarship, even though it's fairly recent. It's 12 years old uh, or 13 years old now, but at the time of the conference, it was only nine years old and there's a wealth of publications. And to me, uh, as someone who, who had seen the film, it's an extremely musical film. Um, the music is a, has a very prominent role in the overall um, aesthetic experience uh, uh, of watching it. And I didn't see any discussion of this in the press, really, uh, a little bit in the press, in scholarship. And I was thinking, 
what is, you know, this film that explicitly uses animated reenactments in a nested narrative form to tell these stories. Uh, what, and it's incredibly musical to me as someone who's attuned to those things, right, as a musicologist, um, I, I wanted to investigate this further. And to answer your question about what roles, um, I, I argue that, um, that in looking at the soundtrack's genre eclecticism, which brings together common practice, European art music, uh, popular music, both from Israel and also um, Euro-American Euro spheres, um, newly composed instrumental soundtracks by the, by, by the um, composer Max Richter. Um, I, in looking at that genre eclecticism, I associate each of these types of music as having, um, as doing different kinds of memory work essentially, um, because it is a very complicated narrative frame. You have, um, you have this, this narrative of, of Ari Fulman, the filmmaker, you know, being depicted himself in the film, right? Thinking about like uh, going through the process of searching for his own lost memory of being one of the soldiers, Israeli soldiers at Sabra and Shatila who aided in the massacre, um, which was carried out by a Lebanese militia, by the way, um, called Falange. Um, that's one level of narrative. Then you have um, um, moments of him interviewing his contemporaries who were there also and getting their perspectives. And like a third nested level, you have actual reenactments from the battlefield, from uh, life as a soldier in between moments of fighting. And they're highly stylized and both um, the sound editing and especially the musical soundtrack are really instrumental in initiating these shifts in narrative frame of dramatizing moments in certain ways. Um, and so um, it's a little bit, my chapter is a little bit of more of a technical analysis uh, in the sense that I'm looking specifically at narrative function and musical soundtrack in those ways. Thank you, Mike. Um, and so for my last question, um, I'd like to ask all of you to respond, which is the following. Um, what did you learn about yourself in researching and eventually writing your piece for this volume. And I'll, I'll start by inviting Imani. Uh, sure. Um, I learned a lot about myself, uh, probably more than I was prepared for at that particular moment in time. Um, I uh, was living in a basement um, in someone's house in DC. Uh, when the majority of this um, uh, of, of this essay was written, um, working for working for NPR um, in the wake of um, Charlottesville and uh, Proud Boys coming to DC and and other things of, of that moment, and so I was uh, I was experiencing a lot of the more news related aspects of 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 this essay kind of in in real time even more than just what we see unfortunately on a regular basis and have seen for the past uh decade now and i thought that maybe this would be something that i couldn't do because it was happening at all times at all moments um and it seemed never ending um, and, um, and, and unstoppable. And uh, I think through the process of writing this, I was able to see the, the power of this conversation um, and how I could help to facilitate um, that conversation and try to uh, try to give back uh, some people's uh, voices that had been missing. And, and I did not know that that was something that I had the ability to do. So it really opened me up to a space um, where I was able to think about my work as a musicologist in a way that I hadn't before. Uh, that was something that was really possible um, that, uh, that my work could really live and be a part of the world in a real substantive way 
Uh, and that was not something that I thought was necessarily the domain of myself and my, and my own work. So uh, I think that was the thing that I learned the most about myself uh, in, in this process is that I had, that I had something to say that was not just for, for me <laughs> um, and my, my own desire around my own scholarship, but uh, something that actually could resonate in the world. Thank you, Imani. Andrea? Yeah, I think building on that, um, I'm not sure I, I would um, position myself in that, uh, I mean, different context where I was working and where I was thinking, but I was similarly kind of compelled and intimidated by um, like an intensity of activity and an intensity of of um, events, of um, of dissent, of um, unrest, and of trauma, and um, I think that I am really thankful for this volume, but also for the pace at which and the, and the number of conversations it facilitated along the way, because. Um, I think it, it demonstrates to me something that we can all continue, oh, I would offer maybe for us to continue to learn from in the present moment where time seems so unruly, so so infinite, um, but so filled at the same time is that, is that um, or simultaneously, um, is that I think just pausing to sit and think instead of um, making a quick analysis or thinking about an impulsive or instinctual read of some of these moments of extraordinary emotional and affective intensity, um, oftentimes in which our sensory systems are overloaded and, and destabilized um, along, you know, depend, like, you know, in, in many different ways, depending on how we experience and attune ourselves to our environments. Um, it's just a, a message to me to, to, in moments where it seems like the most logical thing is to act, um, is that there's actually incredible power to sitting and thinking and to listening um, and to trying to locate um, locate affinities between yourself and the communities around you, but also turn away from the ones um, where the, the instrumentalization of the trauma um, strikes strikes a chord in, the, in a negative sense in you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, Mike. Yeah, a lot of what Andrea just said really resonates with my experience as well. I'll say the thing that I learned most about myself has to do with humility. Um, and I'll say that um, one thing I didn't get around to talking about just now about my essay, which I, I to be sure, I'm, I'm happy with. Um, humility, and I, and I hope folks in film studies and film music studies and, and, and elsewhere will engage with it. But um, I, I gain humility before the subject of my essay and of the volume. Um, is, you know, um, one thing to say is that um, I described the film as an aesthetic triumph, right? But actually, I was, uh, what I didn't get around to saying is I'm actually quite critical of the filmmaker um, in my analysis and, and his rendering of his own trauma versus the trauma of the, the um, Palestinian victims and survivors of Sabra and Shatila. Um, but one thing in the, in the course of both working on my essay and also reading all the other contributions and thinking about our introduction and everything, um, is, is getting some humility perspective that I think all scholars, particularly of historical subjects need, which is, which is the realization that we weren't there. And we're always, you know, insofar as our own work um, represents these moments, just like acts of commemoration, just like reenactments do, right? We, we need to have the kind of humility of knowing that we're, we're, all, we're constantly triaging and triangulating uh, pieces of evidence and, and our perspective uh, is, is rooted in that. So another example would be the, the our introduction, which talks about Silent Sam, and it represents the actions of, I mentioned, our student activists, um, historical subjects um, at the dedication of the monument. You know, and I wasn't there for either of those things, right? Um, and we pull together um, our evidence to tell these stories, but there's always more to be done. Um, both in terms of reevaluating things that have already happening, but all happened, but also things that will continue to happen, as Andrea mentioned um, in a few of her comments about how much things have changed since we put this project together. And the last thing I'll say is I learned humility before the breadth of expertise represented by our different contributors. Um, 
I learned so much from reading and engaging with this work in person and also through the editorial process. And I'm just really grateful for what a, a good faith collaboration of this whole product ended up being. And I thank all of our contributors for that. Thank you, Mike. And Anagret. I want to pick up on where Mike ended with the collaboration. I think that was the first thing that was really important for me, that um, it offered the opportunity to be in conversation with people whose work I deeply admire. It offered the opportunity to work with Mike, which was great. We were talking at one point about the introduction and we couldn't pull apart who wrote what anymore because it had become such an amalgamation and, uh, of ideas. And that was actually a wonderful thing. Uh, so that was one of the things I learned, just the joy. I mean, it's perhaps a paradox because we were working and are working on something that's so painful that deals with pain, commemoration, trauma, all this kind of stuff. And yet there is joy in doing a project like that, in discovering ways to speak, in sharing, all of those things, I think I, I learned that um, through the project. As far as my own uh, chapter goes, um, I have been working a lot on war. I think what I started learning is what happens when a war is over, which is something that we are constantly confronted with nowadays as well. What happens when you know, the, the capital has been emptied of, of, of the terrorists, the domestic terrorists. How do people start talking with each other? And that's happened in the 20s as well. Um, what happens when they stop shooting at each other? How can a thing, how does silence work in that? What gets silenced? What gets commemorated? All these kind of things. That's become something I'm more and more now interested in. But the lynch point for that question really was writing this text. And um, one of the things that I learned as well that has an eerie and painful echo right now is um, how pandemics create silence. Uh, one of the things that uh, William Brooks and Danish Ertan were saying in a paper that I'm quoting is that while war brought a lot of commemoration, the influenza, the Spanish flu had no music, it was silent. And I don't, we are in the middle of a pandemic, so we can't say whether it is silent as well or whether there's a different way of response, but it has tuned my ears to a lot of silence about suffering that's happening very much at this point. When the project started, Mike and I had that conversation in 2016 and it got published at the end of 2019. So if, if you all, so if you think about the political framework within which this all happened, um, I mean, in the editing, both Mike and I have received emails from plenty of our contributors who said, you know, I'm so shocked how it's still relevant. It's still relevant. It's even more relevant. Um, yeah. I was just going, this is depressing. You know, we, yeah. we did this in 2017 and there was Charlottesville and then silence came down and it all seemed to get better. And then, um, the whole production of the book was very much shaped by George Floyd and Brianna Taylor. We had production staff who couldn't work anymore and mm. actually uh, were on sick leave because they were so deeply affected by, um, by the murder of George Floyd. Wow. Uh, so it's, uh, I think of everything I've ever done, this is the piece that had most to do with what you're currently living through. Thank you, Anna Grant. Um, so it, it's indeed a, a, a powerful volume, probably the, one of the more important um, volumes that I've read recently. Um, and so I wanna congratulate and thank all of you for all of your work. And I think we should also mention uh, your other contributors, uh, colleagues who contribute, contributed to the volume, uh, who include Philip Bowman, Noriko Manabe, Lillian Wool, Vanessa Agnew, Sylvia Angelique Alajaji, Cherie Rivers and Daleko, and Kay Kaufman Chalamet, and a special thanks to Seth, Stefan Litvin, who's our, uh, our colleague here in the Department of Music, who was a co-organizer of the conference that was the, the, uh, the starting point of this project, um, and working with Annegret Fauser and uh, Mike Figueroa. I would also like to thank on behalf of the department, uh, Catherine Zachary, 
who's our communications coordinator, and Jesse Moorfield, who's our production manager for assisting in producing and editing uh, the uh, video that we've presented here. Thank you all very much for joining us.